Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here on another edition of Extreme Health Radio, another episode. I want to thank you for taking some time out of your day and uh, listening to this interview with Daniel Vitalis. This is going to be a good interview. I'm really excited about having Daniel on. So it's going to be lots of fun. And we are currently broadcasting worldwide from Southern California. It's a cloudy, cold, wintry day here. So hopefully you're getting better weather than we are. And I want to let you know that we broadcast four days a week on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And we usually do a weekend show as well. So if you'd like to follow us on Facebook, we would greatly appreciate that. Join our community at ExtremeHealthRadio.com slash Facebook. And I want to thank Mike Adams of NaturalNewsRadio.com for having us on his network. He's got a great network with lots of great radio programs on there. So I want to thank Mike Adams for that. And this is, for reference, Tuesday, a special Tuesday show on February 19th, 2013. And this is episode number 64. So you could find the show at ExtremeHealthRadio.com slash 64 if you're looking for the show notes or the transcriptions or anything like that. And if you ever have a question for our guest, please email them to me at justin at extremehealthradio.com or feel free to call our voicemail line. It goes straight to voicemail. That is 949-391-7363. And I want to just let you know that this show is going to be brought to you by amazon.com. And if you ever purchase on Amazon, feel free to go through our link, which is extremehealthradio.com slash Amazon, and that will allow us to get a commission for your order, and that would help support our work as well. And before we introduce Mr. Vitalis on our show, I want to just tell you a little bit of our upcoming show schedule. On Wednesday, which is tomorrow, February 20th, we have Dr. Ed Group, and he runs the Global Healing Center, so that should be a great show. And then we have uh, on Friday, February 22nd, Timothy Hickey of Friends of Water. And then on Monday, February 25th, we have Dr. Alejandro Younger. I believe that's how you say his last name. He's the director and founder of The Clean Program. So he'll be talking about colon cleansing and his cleanse as well. So that should be a fun, fun time. And we have Daniel Vitalis today. He's a great guy. He's a leading health motivator, a health strategist, a nutritionist, herbalist, all around kind of wild guy and he is a uh, an educator and goes all around the world teaching people about rewilding themselves and nutrition and all kinds of good stuff like that and he runs a website his blog is at danielvitalis.com and he also has a company called surthrival.com and they sell all kinds of great supplements and things there so thank you so much daniel for being on our show today man yeah happy to be here with you justin Oh, that's awesome. So you are, I was just talking to you before the show, you're in Arizona. Yeah, so I've been wintering in Sedona doing my migratory pattern from <laughs> uh, from Maine up in uh, New England down here for the winters and uh, just trying to keep my sun exposure up, honestly. Living out in Maine for the winter <clears throat> is amazing. It's quiet, but uh, you know the snow and the uh, cold make it pretty hard to get outside as much as you'd like. Are you finding that as you progress and continue on this health path and get older that you are not necessarily liking the long winters as much or do you just kind of enjoy the sun more? You know what I think, and and, and I think it's going to be key to what we're talking about today, um, in the subject of rewilding, you know, what I'm really interested in is how much of our physiology and how much of our health depends on us being in natural environments. And human beings today, we spend, I think it's like nine, over 90% of our time indoors now. So this is obviously not a very natural pattern for us. The very word indoors is an unnatural word because obviously we didn't come from a place initially where there were doors or there were walls, where there was a way to really block out the sunlight the way we do. So we have minimized our exposure to sun so dramatically that it's really begun to affect our health. And we're hearing all the time about the important benefits, the anti anti-cancer properties, um, all the hormonal effects of vitamin D, vitamin D3 in our body, what I'm finding is it's not just the long, cold winter. It's, it's not like, oh, it's too cold for me. It's that there's not enough sunlight for me to actually maintain my sense of well-being. So what I've found is that if I can be around sun, uh, significant sunlight, the kind that can actually tan your skin. Mm-hmm. So even if we went outside in Maine and I was able to tolerate the cold enough to lay out there naked in the sun at noon, I couldn't tan because of the angle of the sun 
sunlight's coming through the atmosphere. But here in Arizona, I can do that, um, and I can actually get a tan on my skin. And what I find is, in, in addition to increasing my vitamin D levels, it keeps my serotonin levels up, and I feel better. And I woke up today having just been in the desert and gotten a lot of sun this weekend, and I was thinking, wow, I feel really good. What's going on here? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was that I got my, my skin tanned for the first time in a couple of weeks. Wow. So do you think that we store up our vitamin Ds enough, do you think, in the summer to carry us through the winter or not so much? Well, here's how, here's how that works. It's a really interesting story here because <laughs> we do, uh, as you know, Homo sapien, the animal Homo sapien, has been able to colonize nearly the entire globe. So we find people living in, in dramatic ranges of habitat, right, from, from the, those real extreme jungle equatorial zones to the boreal zones of, say, northern Canada where the Inuit would live. That's a big range, right? It's dramatic for an animal. Yeah. There are people who live in places where the sun is extremely regular. So around the equator, they're not needing to store up a lot of vitamin D. They're getting their exposure every day. But then you have people who live in those boreal regions, like what's those people we call the Eskimo, who are actually called the Inuit. Those people would be exposed to sufficient uh, UV radiation or sufficient sun, they get sufficient sun exposure in the summertime, mm -hmm. and then they would store that fat-soluble vitamin D in their liver throughout the winter, but they would also supplement that because those were people who were eating fish oils and uh, fish livers and the livers of mammals where those animals were storing their vitamin D, and they would actually get vitamin D from that in their diet. So there are people who live in the northern latitudes now who do store up some vitamin D, but remember, they're not getting sufficient sun exposure. Even if they're getting out, you know, a couple days a week to go out on hikes or walks, that's not like what our bodies were designed for. So right. they're probably getting insufficient vitamin D. Now, they are storing some, but unless they're eating those foods that are really rich in, in vitamin D, there's going to be a deficiency there. So um, somebody can store up sufficient vitamin D, but I think if they live in a place you know, where there's limited sun exposure, they'd be wise to, to look at traditional remedies for vitamin D deficiency like um, fish oils, like fish liver oils, cod liver oil is a great example. Um, I want to add one caveat to that too, and that's that the darker your skin is, the more you're going to need that sun exposure and the more you're going to need that vitamin D because pigment in the skin reflects, refracts off sunlight. Mm -hmm. And what that's designed to do is keep people from being burned who live in those more equatorial regions. So if somebody is, say, African descended and they're living in the northern latitudes like where I live in Maine, they're going to need a lot more sun than I need. And I'm going to need a lot more sun than somebody who maybe is descended from Scotland is going to need. Right. They're going to have much fairer skin. So each person needs to not only think about, hey, where do I live in relationship to what I need for sun exposure and vitamin D, but also um, what's my skin like? Where am I from? Yeah, I totally agree. And just a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I went out to Palm Springs and did the same thing you're doing. We laid out in the sun and man, it's funny how in the summer you kind of take that for granted, but how good that feels in the wintertime, you know? Yeah, the sense of well-being, you know, yeah. especially that next day you wake up and it's like there's some kind of, I don't know that we have sufficiently explained it scientifically. Perhaps it's a cumulative effect or a, you know, of, of a synergistic effect of, of neurotransmitters like serotonin and, you know, hormone substances like vitamin D, but there's some sense of a recharge that happens. So it's almost, you know, and I think we have this really interesting, you know, a lot of us with our smartphones, you know, you, you spend the day using your phone and you realize how quickly you use up the battery life. Mm. Oh my God, I got to get this thing plugged in somewhere and charge it back up. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening with us. You know, we're all burning the candles at both ends living in our culture, right? We're all working far more, again, on the rewilding topic, you know, the idea of a wild human or an indigenous human, we're talking about people that worked less than 20 hours a week for all their needs. Wow. You know, even in the most extreme environments where it took the most work to get your food, you're looking at a 15-hour work week for most people. Yeah. That's a lot of leisure time or downtime. We're looking at much more work, right? It keeps increasing. And then people have hobbies that are like work. So, you know, somebody might work all day and then they come home and spend two hours on their Facebook working, <laughs> doing online yeah. work for nothing. Yeah. You know, some people it's a business, but some people it's just a hobby. We're working, working, working. And it's like we run the battery way down and getting out into sunlight. And in my opinion, it's not just the sunlight. It's the mixture 
of being out on natural earth or soil, mm -hmm. drinking natural water, breathing natural air, and getting exposure to sunlight, the, those four things together synergistically charge the human battery back up. Wow. So we start to feel like, okay, I'm topped off again. I can kind of go about my life now with full energy. Yeah, it's interesting. I just heard a prominent paleo doctor, uh, Jack Cruz, and he was talking about, he thinks that one of the main things that's wrong with our culture is the uh, exposure to computer light, like computers and iPads and all of that. And gosh, it seems so true when you look at you know, just the diseases that we're getting and you know, just this constant exposure to this blue light, you know? I'd like to yeah, add to that, if I could, and, and I hope I'm not being too redundant with what he might have said, but I'm always, I always marvel at the bold steps humans make without any reflection on it or taking the time to really test something. We jumped into not just the computer age, but the television age and even the radio age. You know, for the listeners out there, it's important, I think, to, to understand that radio uh, frequencies are a form of light. So if you have the right kind of camera, you can see radio. Radio is a light wave. It's electromagnetic. Now, our eyes don't pick it up, but it is a form of light. Mm. Um, you know, uh, x-rays are a form of light, and uh, microwaves, which our phones emit, are a form of light. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there's visible light coming out of all of the screens of our machines. Now, for people in the past, they only saw actual sunlight in its full spectrum emitted from the sun, but we couldn't really look at the sun very often except at sunrise or sunset. Mm -hmm. So the only time we stared into directly into light sources would have been looking at flames, right? Would have been looking at fire, oh. maybe lightning, starlight, and sunrises and sunsets. Now we're spending, and all the other light we saw was reflected light. Right. So when we'd look at a scene, we'd see light bouncing off of something, but that's not a direct light source. That's a mirrored light source. Wow. When you look at a, when you go to watch a movie at a theater, you're seeing reflected light. You're not staring into a light source. That's light being bounced off a screen, and you're seeing it bounce off the screen into your eye. That's a lot different than looking at your laptop. Because when you look at your laptop, you're seeing direct light. You're staring into basically like a light bulb. Wow. And it's shining photons directly into your eye, into your pupil, down your optic nerve, to your brain. So this is really different, and we don't really know the effects of it. But, you know, there's an interesting thing. I like to, you know, to look at all the religious traditions of the world. They're all very interesting to me. And we see this thing come up in the, in the Christian, the Judeo-Christian Bible. It talks about Lucifer being disguised as an angel of light. Oh, right. And it constantly talks about how he wants to usurp the true Son of God. And I always think that's an interesting metaphor, that idea of the Son of God, like the Son. And Lucifer being this, this entity that wants to usurp that or be like it, but isn't it. Yeah. And I think it's a neat metaphor for what we have going on right now. We have the true light of our Son. And that's what our bodies are adapted to, evolved around. That's what's designed to keep us healthier. We're designed to be healthy from it. And then we have this artificial usurping light that people have become literally addicted to, to the point that they spend more time bathing in the glow of their machines than they do in the light of the sun. And what the long-term implications are, we're not even sure. Yeah, I hear it. So a while back when I listened to some of your other stuff, I was listening to some stuff you're doing about rewilding. And, you know, I was just thinking, all right, what ways in my life can I sort of make each thing that I do just a little bit healthier, right? And uh, so one of the things I did was I bought some of those blue light sunglasses. They look like those blue blocker things. Do you think that those are effective for looking at the computer? Well, that's a really good point. I have not looked at that, so that's an excellent point. Um, I don't know, so I can't comment on that. Okay, yeah. there was some... you, how, I'm curious, though, how you're feeling from that, actually. I'd like to know about that. Yeah, well, it's so anecdotal, and it's so hard to know, but I wear them. There's not a time each night that I'm on the computer that I don't wear those, and I have to say that when I have been wearing them, I tend to go to sleep a lot easier, and I tend to sleep better, because apparently it blocks you know, one of the rays of the blue light and and that's what's causing disturbances and things like that. So, I, I don't know. It seems to be working for me, but... That's great. I would love it if you'd send me a link for that. And I, yeah. I would like to, you know, to point out for people that staring into light before you go to bed makes it very difficult to get a sound night's sleep. And in fact, you know, before the computer age really got kicked off, I mean, I remember as a kid, it's so amazing how new this technology is. <laughs> 
You know, I remember as a kid having learned that if you get up in the night, it's really wise not to flick a light on. So say you get up in the night because you need to wander into the bathroom. Uh, if you can do that in total darkness, you'll get back to sleep much better than if you turn on that light. So, you know, it's interesting, this idea, like, just before bed, staring into a direct light source is uh. just not going to be very good for our sleep. Um, and I would love to, to learn more about that uh, blue light frequency. So perhaps you could send that over to me. Yeah, I'll send that over to you. It's a pretty interesting thing. I, I forget who I was listening to talk about it, but it was this whole big thing about, uh, you know, all about that subject and sleeping better and all that. So, uh, And I'd suggest to the listeners... You know, remember that you, uh, you have control over the brightness of your screen on, on, on your handheld machines and on your laptop machines and on your desktop machines. So you may want to just adjust the light down, especially when it's not super critical that you can, you know, I understand if you're watching a program, maybe you want to have the, the screen turned right up. But when you're reading a document, for instance, it's wise to, to turn that down. And I know that it's not considered environmentally friendly, but I often find myself wanting to print off documents rather than read them. Uh, on a screen. Because again, when you're looking at a direct light source, that's really different than looking at reflected light off of a piece of paper. Yeah. So while, you know, the document on the screen is white, uh, and the document in your hand might be white, you're, it's very different because one's actually white light and the other one is reflecting uh, white light. So very different stuff. And I think also that there's great technology in those e-ink readers. You know, if anybody has um, one of those Amazon Kindles or maybe a Nook, um, those devices, when you shut the lights off, don't emit light. You can't see them without light, uh, and they're very easy on the eyes, so that's a nice alternative. Yeah, you know, recently my wife and I were talking about turning off all the lights at night and just using those. We've got those little candles that are those candles that just run on batteries. They're the fake ones, and mm -hmm. we've got a ton of those, and I don't know, we're considering doing that because, you know, it's all about getting a better sleep, and, you know, I just feel like we're never meant to be walking around, you know, at midnight with lights and working on computers just like we do, you know, it's, it's kind of nuts. Right, yeah. so the length of our day, the, or what's <laughs> expected of us, keeps extending as well, right? It keeps yeah. pushing back further and further, and I'm finding, you know, as I get older, as I go further into the business world, you know, the demands are keep increasing. And so we have to become um, very uh, aware of anything that's encroaching on our sleep. Mm -hmm. And while we're talking about sleep, I want to say this for people. I think one of the most important things people can do for their health is give themselves permission to sleep as much as they need to. Yeah. You know, and if you're saying, if you're hearing this and you're going, well, that sounds nice. I have to be up every morning at five. I'd say, hey, you, you get to choose your life. I mean, you can, it might take time, but you can restructure your life so that you can have the sleep that you need. You know, I, I think of people as running a sleep deficit. So what's happening is, you know, if they need an eight-hour night's sleep and they're sleeping seven every night, well, then each night they're kind of accumulating this hour of rest that they need for total regeneration. If you're somebody who just, you know, maybe you have a situation with kids, uh, maybe you have a situation with work where you have to get up really early and you're just not getting enough sleep, then when your weekends roll around or your time off rolls around, I encourage you to give yourself permission to sleep in one day as much as you need with zero guilt. Even if it's one time, just one time in 2013, you give yourself permission to sleep as long as you want one day with no guilt. That means, no, oh, so I should probably mow the lawn, I should probably get those emails out, I should probably yeah. write that letter that I said I would write. Just sleep yeah. as long as you need to. Um, it's amazing how much better you'll feel. Now, a lot of people have noticed that they allow themselves to sleep in, that they, they feel even more tired when they get up, and that's because the body's getting into that, like, finally, regeneration mode, I want to sleep. Um, give yourself permission, because your culture is not going to give you permission, and nobody else is going to give you permission. So that's a, that's a gift you have to give yourself. Yeah, I totally agree. I think as a culture, we're so spent on doing, 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 instead of just allowing ourselves to be sometimes. And, you know, it, it's such a, a culture that's dominated by production and things like that. And we start feeling guilty, like you said, for not being able to, or for just sleeping and taking some time for us, you know, it's cr crazy. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been really blessed with a dog that's come into my life in the last year and um, been living with this dog now for a while and noticing the difference when she rests compared to when I rest. Yeah. So 
when, you know, if, if we're going to take a long drive, for instance, or if, if we come home and we're just not going to do anything for a couple hours, she just curls up somewhere in a very comfortable position and just goes to sleep. And she'll do that for hours and hours and hours. I drove from Maine to Arizona, four-day drive with her. She just slept the whole time. No way. I noticed that myself, if I have some time to rest, I think, oh, maybe I can read something. Maybe I can do something with my hands. Yeah. It's very difficult to actually step away and unplug completely from that sense of needing to do things. Yeah. Um, again, though, there's this idea that, like, we're burning that candle, right? right? And that candle is your lifespan, and you can burn it slowly or you can burn it fast. And I think all of us would benefit from just notching back a couple degrees, you know, burning that a little bit slower. In other words, taking more time to rest and less time to do. Um, there's a sense like, oh my God, culture will bowl me over if I don't, if I rest. Yeah. I've got to keep up, right? Things keep changing. Technology keeps changing. The emails keep coming in. The Facebooks, the tweets, all the stuff keeps coming and coming in, rolling in. And there's a sense you've got to keep up with it all. But in reality, you know, it's really nice to just unplug yourself from it. I think another great discipline people can start to take on is just you know, from time to time, turning off all your machines mm. that, are, that are microwave transmitters, all of your devices. You know, it's, it's almost, for some people, it's almost frightening to do it. Yeah, it is, it is. You know? Hey, Daniel, we got to take a short break. I want to get into some of these strategies because you have lots of them, and I think it's going to really help our listeners a lot. So we got to take a short break here with Daniel Vitalis. His website is danielvitalis.com, and also his company is called surthrival.com. And uh, we'll be right back after this short break. Rebounding is, in my mind, one of the best ways to detoxify your lymphatic system. And it's the only exercise on earth that will actually detoxify your lymphatic system. And your lymph system is responsible for storing toxins and chemicals and poisons that you're exposed to. And there's no pump for the lymph system. It doesn't have a heart. So you have to move it up and down. And it's filled with millions of one-way valves that get squeezed and pushed and opened and closed every time you jump and we feel like we found the best rebounder on the market today it's the Rolls Royce of rebounding it's called the Bellicon and I highly, highly stand behind this product. It's absolutely amazing. If you want to hear what some of our guests said about it, check them out on our store. You can listen to what a lot of our guests have said about rebounding and the Bellicon in particular. So a lot of times people will go on the rebounder with oxygen for cancer if they're really sick. And it's one of the most powerful things you can do to cleanse your body and to exercise every single cell in your body, every organ in your body. It's the only internal organ exercise you could do and it's absolutely incredible. It also helps to rebuild bone density because of the up and down motion, the G-force that gets applied to every cell of your body and it tightens and tones your body and it's just really, really great aerobic exercise and the Bellicon is made with straps, these bungee cords instead of springs so it's silent and they have a warranty on it. It's the best rebounder on the market today so if you're in the market for one, I would highly recommend just saving up and getting the Bellicon because there's no other rebounder on the market that's better than this thing. I, I firmly believe that. So if you're interested in it, check it out, extremehealthradio.com slash Bellicon. That's B as in boy, E-L-L-I-C-O-N. And you can learn more about it and watch the videos on that page too. So thanks for listening and I hope you enjoy your rebounder and we'll catch you on the next episode. Daniel Vitalis from DanielVitalis.com and SirThrival.com. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today here. Daniel, in honor of rewilding, I decided to use my standing desk during the break, so I'm now standing here while we're doing the interview. <laughs> you know, I do the same thing, and I think it's so valuable. That idea of sitting all day long is so destructive to our body's structural system. Isn't it, though? It's uh, There's so many studies that have been going on lately that talk about it doesn't matter how much you exercise or how you know rigorous your exercise is but that sitting just really I guess damages your your heart and everything else doesn't it well yeah we saw those headlines last month it was like smoking might be worse for you I mean um, sitting might be worse for you than smoking I mean that was pretty shocking to see that kind of research coming out now um, I want to point out something about wild humans and again when I say wild humans I mean humans 
who were indigenous people. And I think, and the reason I bring them up is I just think they are the people for us to look to when we want to figure out health strategies, because they're the ones who lived 200,000 years on this earth in perfect health, or near perfect health, and years who've seen all the degeneration of our, our, um, our health integrity. So I think that they're the people to look towards. Now, what we see is the way that they sit is in a flat-footed squat, right? So they are squatted down deeply, but almost touching the ground, uh, but on their uh, on the backs of their legs, like against their Achilles tendon, uh, and their feet are flat, not up on their toes. So if we grab the average person on the street, we said squat down, their heels will come up off the ground. That's a different position. Right. Their heels are down. Um, Squatting is very difficult for people who sat in chairs forever because they have short tendons. So here's what I'd recommend to everybody. Grab a timer. Maybe that's a timer on your phone, whatever you have. Set a timer for 30 seconds. Squat down if you need to. Hold on to something like a countertop. Squat down uh, flat on your heels and sit down for those full 30 seconds. Do that once a day. Once you get comfortable with that, up it to a minute. I do it for at least a minute every day. Uh, just to keep the limberness in the backs of my legs and just to keep the, my hips and knees to um, being able to do that because I see that that's something that people lose. And we'll see that very old people in cultures that are much closer to their roots are able to do that very comfortably. They don't end up with that degeneration in their backs and knees like we do. Yeah, I think people are super, super tight. And I think that's a result of sitting for so long because we're sitting. I mean, I figured, I wrote an article about this a while back and I think I've, I kind of just averaged out that the, average working adult sits for or uh, is sedentary for about 15 or 16 hours a day which right. is that's unheard of you know yeah it's so funny because we we not only do we sit it goes deeper you remember this program that was put in your mind over and over again justin sits still yeah like not not just sit sit still you know on the break i heard um you talking about lymphatic systems and uh rebounding mm-hmm now, if you think about that idea of rebounding, what's happening is you're constantly jiggling everything. When you stand there at the desk, you know, you kind of sway, rock side to side. Things keep moving. Your body is full of fluids, and fluids have to keep moving. I love the study of water and what we see. What happens when water gets stagnant? If it stops moving, it becomes a bog. It turns into a swamp. Everything starts to rot. When you keep water moving, it cleans itself. So we see with creeks and springs that they stay remarkably clean from source all the way to the ocean because they keep moving. When our fluids become stagnant, you know, if you're going to sit, keep moving, Mm -hmm. right? Don't sit still. And man, if you see yourself say, if you hear that coming out of your mouth talking to a kid, you need to reassess that. I think it's amazing that we'll take a kid and we'll stick them in a white room with white fluorescent lamps in an uh, ergonomically dysfunctional chair, and if they can't sit still for five hours, we'll drug them because we say they have an attention deficit. It's completely crazy, isn't it? It's, it blows my mind. It's criminal. It's actually criminal. So what yeah. will happen is we'll have a day where we'll look back yeah. and we'll see that, like we see some of the acts that the Germans did in you know World War II. We'll look back and go, oh my God, this! How did we ever allow this um, medical tech, you know, technocracy um, drug our children for being normal? Mm-hmm. I hear you. And so, what are some ways that people can rewild themselves? Like, uh, first of all, let me just ask you, what would be an ideal situation for man on the planet now? What would be the most ideal living environment if you could paint a picture of that? What would that be? That's a really good question. I want to um, open this up to everybody here and say that, you know, this is something I don't have a fantastic answer for because if I did, that's where I'd be okay. right now as we're having this conversation. <laughs> yeah. I'm also looking for that, and here's why this is a challenging thing to answer. And I know a lot of people would just give you an answer to this, but let's be real here. Mm. Human beings are a very unique species. We come from our wild form, the indigenous form, and we are now a domestic form. So this is similar to the way that you have the wild dog, which is the gray wolf and only the gray wolf. All of our domestic dogs come from gray wolves. And then we have a broad range of domestic dogs, right? Would it be fair to say, what's, if you said, Daniel, what's the ideal uh, environment and situation for a domestic dog? Well, you know, Justin, it's tough, right? Because it's like, are we talking about a greyhound or a pit bull? Yeah. These are incredibly different dogs, right? Yeah. They appear, even though they're the same species, there's so much variety in dogs that it'd be hard to say what the ideal environment for a dog would be. Mm. You know, the 
it, the, a miniature dachshund with legs that are only three inches long is going to need a very different environment than, say, my dog, which loves to run around on rocks and cliffs. Right, right. You know, a dachshund's not going to be able to do that. So now let's translate that over to humans. We see a huge variety. Short people, tall people, dark people, light people, heavier people, thinner people, you know, people who carry more body fat, people who carry less body fat, you know, people whose skin is so fair that 10 minutes out in the noonday sun can burn them, and people who are so dark that they could spend eight hours in the sun in Africa, right. right? This is a big variety. So to say what's the ideal situation for us is challenging. Mm. Here's another interesting thing. Some people do really well in high humid in, uh, humidity environments. I'm not one of those people. So when I visit the jungles, I find, wow, this is not good for my health. Uh, you've, you've mentioned I'm wintering in Arizona right now where the air is very dry. I do really well with that. So each person needs to start thinking about what's your ideal environment. What's your ideal temperature range? What's your ideal amount of sun exposure? It's a more varied question. It's not super easy to answer. But what I can say is we all need to get out in the sun to some degree, especially around noontime when the sun's at its highest in the sky. Mm -hmm. We all benefit from fresh air. We all benefit from clean water. We all benefit from foods that are closer to their wild or heirloom varieties than they are to these heavily domestic and obviously genetically modified varieties. Right. So going back um, almost towards that wild way is better for everybody, but each of us needs to determine the ideal situation for themselves. So, you know, when I was thinking about this and this upcoming interview and, you know, just a lot of the stuff that you talk about, you know, I kind of was thinking about taking stock in every area of my life because I work at home and, you know, a lot of people don't, a lot of people go to an office, but it's still a similar situation in terms of sitting at a desk and computers and stuff. But I was just thinking about, all right, what about my sleep environment? What about my work environment? What about my, you know, the rest of my home? And, you know, I just started to take stock and think, all right, what is unnatural about each one of these different areas? Is that kind of how you first started out kind of getting into this rewilding thing and looking at more natural ways of doing the things that you're doing that are deemed unnatural? I did, and I think now looking back on that, I could give people a sequential order that would be really helpful. Okay. So let's start with um, being awake and being asleep, okay. right? Those are the two major kind of um, <laughs> aspects of our consciousness, right? right? So we need to think about our waking day and our sleeping life. And, you know, your sleeping life is a third of your life. So, I mean, this is a lot to think about. I'm going to point out a couple of things real quick about natural human sleep. The first is there are natural sleeping positions that human beings use, right? So when people have traveled around anthropologists studying indigenous peoples and indigenous and traditional groups as well, looked at their sleep patterns, we see that there's actually sleeping positions. So I noticed my dog has a sleeping position, a couple of them that she uses. Uh -huh. One's called quadrupedal lying, and the other one she curls up into a little ball. Okay. Now, humans have sleeping positions, and they don't include pillows. So I know that for at first is a little shocking, like, oh my God, well, what will support my neck? Yeah. Well, there's a way to sleep without a pillow. And basically, if you laid on your side, and you allowed your legs to scissor apart a little bit, and then the shoulder that's down on the bedside side went behind you and you let your arm go behind you, your body suddenly goes totally into a flat position and your head rests perfectly in line with your spine. Now you need a nice firm bed for that, mm -hmm. a nice flat surface. Um, if you're on a bed that's too cramped or too gushy, it doesn't work well. But I think people would be amazed at how much less neck discomfort they would have during their waking life if they slept without a pillow. So that's the first thing I want to point out. There are natural sleep positions, and there's more of them, but it'd be difficult for me to describe that all over the over a, you know by talking about them. I kind of have to see them. But the main one is, you know, when people think about no pillow, or when you ask somebody to lay down without a pillow, what they tend to do is lay on top of their shoulder and try to use their hands as pillows. Okay. Now that's really bad for your arm. Or the other one will be to flip the arm up so that the elbow sticks out past the head and you're laying on your, on your arm. That actually just hurts your shoulder over time. Okay. So when people end up with problems with their neck, I say lay down on your side and take the arm that's down and move it completely behind your body. It's going to feel a little funny at first and then you're going to go, oh my God, this is really comfortable. Really? Okay. So that'd be the first thing I'd recommend. And we talked about a lot of other things. I would recommend looking at really good bedding. 
I sleep on a bison skin every night with my partner. <laughs> so she and I have, uh, you know, and it, it, it's kind of funny, but it's actually f- superior to anything else I've used. So, you know, you can look at your bedding, you know, you can buy organic materials. Do you you know, if you're going to use pillows, you could use wool, wool pillows instead of, you know, synthetics, or you could use natural down instead of a synthetic. You can use organic cottons or silks or fantastic materials. But I would get away from synthetic materials uh, for your bed and bedding. So do you sleep on a traditional bed with that as a cover or just that on the ground? I actually sleep on a futon mattress, an organic futon mattress. So it's okay. a, you know, organic wool and cotton filled uh, you know, futon that sits on a flat plywood surface. So it's very rigid compared to, it's soft, but it doesn't give anywhere. You know, those, those, those beds with the springs in them, I mean, really, you know, especially as we start to understand more and more that we're bioelectrical organisms. Right. You know, the idea of sleeping on metal coils is a little bit strange, right? Now, if we added a little current to that, that thing would, you know, you could imagine how each one of those coils would, would send electricity through you and electrify you. Right. Well, what are, what are those coils doing to all of the cell phone tower emissions that are coming, uh, you know, around your house? Uh-huh. Are they antennas for that? Obviously, right? Obviously. Right. So if you're getting cell phone reception in your bedroom, then your mattress with all those coils in it's basically an antenna, right? Mm-hmm. So it might be wise to move away from those coils and get into a mattress that doesn't contain something like that. And there are lots of options. I like, I like a futon because I can replace it fairly inexpensively fairly often. I'll put my bison on top of that and sleep on top of it. Or sometimes I use the bison on top of me like a blanket. Um, and then I also have you know natural organic um, blankets as well. So that for me has been amazing. Now I find the pillow thing, you know, we are all conditioned to use pillows. We've used pillows thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Yeah. So it takes a lot of new repetitions of a new behavior to anchor that in. You'll find you're actually addicted to your pillow. So you may want to uh, try sleeping without your pillow for a night, let yourself have it for a couple nights, give yourself another night, work yourself in slowly. Because you know how it is when you jump into a new habit, it works for a little while and then you find yourself abandoning it. Oh, totally. so, uh, so work it in slowly. Even sometimes what, I would, what I'll do is just use the pillow for a couple hours in the night and discard it for the rest of the night. Mm-hmm. So that works well also. Um, but we have comfort patterns that are built around pillows, so you need to be mindful of that. Yeah, exactly. So do you have any uh, w- websites or places that you go to get those organic futons you're talking about? You know what? I kind of just shop them at random. So what I just recommend somebody gets online, puts in organic futons, and you're going to find there's a few major distributors, but I don't have a brand or a particular company that I'd okay. recommend, but they're very easy to find. And actually, uh, just they're a bit expensive to ship to you, um, but you know, compared against what people are spending on some of these high-end metal coil mattresses or these Tempur-Pedic type um, synthetic materials, um, I think you'll find it's going to be rather affordable. Oh, right, right. All right, we were with Daniel Vitalis. We're up against another break. I uh, apologize for that. His website is danielvitalis.com as well as surthrival.com. And we'll continue right after this break. There's no real way to avoid toxins or chemicals in our daily life. It seems like we're exposed to them no matter what we do in our lives, from paint fumes to mercury fillings, coal fire plants, perfumes, soaps, off-gassing of carpets in our houses, and genetically modified modified foods and foods that are sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, the xenoestrogens in plastics and car exhaust, secondhand smoke, even your dry cleaning and laundry detergents, even your mattresses have chemicals inside them that outgas. So getting these toxins and chemicals and poisons out of your bloodstream and out of your fat cells is going to be really critical moving forward uh, in our society because it seems like every year there's more and more chemicals that keep becoming introduced with new products in the market. So I would consider getting one of these far infrared saunas. We've got a great, great sauna developed by Phil Wilson. And I've known about his work for many, many years. And I'm so proud to be offering his sauna on our website. And he's been in this business since 1975. And the sauna is really great because it slows the aging process. It helps with weight loss and burning calories. I think you can burn like 600 calories in 15 or 20 minutes. And it helps to cleanse the skin. It improves your sleep and helps to prevent illnesses like flus and colds as well as energizing the body and it's great for improving blood circulation and promoting cellular renewal as well as increasing metabolism and inducing profuse sweating and it's really, really great. And the great thing is too is you don't produce any lactic acid so you can 
and sweat without producing any of this lactic acid that you would normally produce if you lifted weights or went for a big long run. So if you're interested in this, you can check it out, extremehealthradio.com slash sauna. It's great because it sets up in about two to five minutes and it's portable and it's super easy to clean. It's got low electromagnetic field radiation coming off of it and it produces energy and heat inside the sauna evenly. It's great, great machine. So if you're interested in sweating like this for only 15 minutes a day, uh, it's great. It requires zero preheating. It's got a one-year warranty. And Phil Wilson is a great guy. We're so proud to be offering his saunas on our website. So if you're interested, check it out, extremehealthradio.com slash sauna. Or you could check it out in our store, and it's $990 plus $25 shipping. And that's really a good deal because many of the saunas out there, you can check them out. They're in the thousands of dollars, two to four thousand dollars. So this is great. You can buy it through PayPal. You don't even need a PayPal account, it's 100% secure. So consider doing this if you're interested in uh, living a long, healthy, disease-free life. So check it out, extremehealthradio.com slash sauna. All right, we're having a good time with Daniel Vitalis, the man, and uh, it's a lot of good, good information being shared here. So, uh, Daniel Vitalis, I had a lot of information to get to, but I'm really kind of keen on just continuing on with this rewilding thing that you're talking about. What are some other strategies, or did you want to continue on some of the sleep strategies that people can, can do for themselves? Well, you know, I just wanted to say one last thing about sleep, I and mean, there's so much we could say about it, but... You know, let's conclude it with this. Um, at night, it's really wise to power off your phones and your iPads, whatever other kind of tablets you might have, or at least put them onto their airplane settings so they're not transmitting. Okay. Um, remember that even if your phone is uh, not currently making a call, it's constantly searching the towers for more information, new emails, new texts, so it's transmitting often. Um, and other people's phones can transmit through your phones. In other words, your phone becomes like a way station for other phones. So. Um, you want to shut that off. And I also recommend you unplug your Wi-Fi so that you have um, a relatively frequency-free house while you sleep. You'll find that that will um, in, in affect your sleep dramatically. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, there's those days where we've you know, woken up and realized we forgot to shut off our Wi-Fi, and it's like you wake up groggy, and you wake up like with weird dreams you know, <laughs> circulating in your head. And I've really traced that back to that. So right. I'd recommend you make your, your home as radio-free as possible uh, when you sleep. Okay. Um, you know, moving on from the topic of sleep, I think that the next big obvious one is food. I mean, I think we need to talk about food, and then yeah. and that's the really that's the root of you know where all of this these changes to human beings that have taken place over the last ten thousand years really stem from. Um, today, you know, I want to point out that when I talk about a diet, I'm not talking about a diet, uh, a set of rules. Uh -huh. uh, that's not what I mean. And when I say diet, I'm not talking about a thing you do to lose weight either. When I say diet, I mean it from the biological perspective. It's the stuff you eat. You're on a diet, whether, uh, whether you mean to be or not, everybody's on a diet, right? Because we all have a diet. We all eat things. <laughs> right. I, I have this, you know, this thing in my head, you know, since I was young, it's been obvious to me. And I think it's fairly obvious to people once you say it. If we went into the wild and we found a chimpanzee and we brought that chimpanzee to our home, let's say, or to, let's say we brought it to a zoo, mm -hmm. we would have to decide what to feed that chimpanzee. And if we started feeding it, you know, the standard American diet, I think it's obvious that animal would get pretty sick. Right. Um, then if we came to the conclusion, okay, you know, we need to feed it a very natural diet, we probably wouldn't go to the health food store to buy it, you know, brown rice and lentils and, you know, uh, supplements. We would probably say, we need to look at what the wild chimps eat, and then we should try to translate that over as best as we can and structure this chimp's diet around the wild chimp diet. Okay. I mean, doesn't that kind of that make sense, right? Yeah, completely. It wouldn't make sense to say, well, let's just make up a diet for the chimpanzee. Right, right. And that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's what we do to ourselves, right? So here we have all over the world traditional and indigenous societies that have lived in near perfect health for, when I say thousands of years, I actually mean 200,000 years, and that's just in our most recent form, but we know that this actually goes back a couple of million years. 
Wow. Right? And people had near perfect health. We had almost no cancer. We had almost no heart disease, almost no arthritis. Until we start really changing our diet. We're at this point now where we just change our diet at random. You know, you see these things like the onion soup diet. <laughs> right. Like, what? You know, the South Beach diet. These are just made up diets. People are not going back and looking at what our actual indigenous diet is. Now, people are starting to. We're seeing these movements. Um, for instance, a great, you know, there's a big paleo and um, uh, kind of primitive diet um, that's emerging. Mm-hmm. However, it's often based off of a, a misconception of what people, it was, it's almost based off of a caveman mythology. Okay. Again, people need to look at the actual indigenous people, their diets, which have been recorded. And what we can see is that they eat a very wide variety of things. So I think one mistake we see sometimes in the new emerging paleo diet scene is the idea that people only ate you know, meat and eggs. <laughs> right, right. And they'll, be a, they'll, they'll fail to, to see the diversity of the 200 plants a year that are in an indigenous diet. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. What we see in the raw food and kind of vegan world is this heavy focus on the plants and this disdain for the animal products. If we look at an actual indigenous diet, we see that there's meats. We see that there's green plants. We see that there's medicinal herbs. We see that there's a lot of seeds. We see that there are mushrooms. We see that there's honey. We see actually that there's insects, interestingly. Uh huh. Now, a lot of us don't have access to the foods that we would have had access to if we had lived in a natural environment. So we have to actually start to replicate it. We're like the chimp in a zoo in Manhattan. And since Manhattan doesn't have access to all those foods that that would come from the chimp environment, we have to make do with what we have. Here's my recommendation to people. Wherever your diet's at, if you're totally on a McDonald's diet, let's start there. The first thing you want to do is start to get yourself onto a whole food diet. If you're on a processed food diet, you want to start looking at foods that are whole and intact. And I bet a lot of the people listening already do that. Mm -hmm. If you're eating whole foods, I want to recommend that you start looking towards organic foods and getting onto a totally organic diet. This is more important than ever, right? Because not only is our food incredibly changed from its wild form, but now it's being genetically changed. It's actually being, you know, genetically modified. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's clear. The real basic distilled version of this is that genetically modified foods damage the liver, they damage the kidneys, and they tend to lead towards sterility. Wow. In humans, they tend to sterilize people. Genetically modified foods are essentially like a eugenics program in a diet. Right. You know, they make you incapable of reproduction. And some people might go, well, I don't care. I don't mean to have kids. Well, you don't want to have your sex hormones dropped off. Trust me. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right? no good. So organic foods are becoming more and more important because it's getting harder and harder to keep track of what's genetically modified and what's not. And if something is genetically modified, it can't be labeled organic currently. So we need to keep an eye on that. But I'd go towards organic food. Now, if you're, say you're somebody who's like, I'm doing that. I'm going to Whole Foods or whatever. I'm getting all my foods organic. Now what you want to do is start finding your local food. You want to find local producers, and that means finding your farmer's markets and your CSA, the Consumer Supported Agriculture Programs in your area, where you actually get your food from local farms. Once you're doing that, you can really start to talk to the person producing your food, and you can start to choose the varieties of foods that you're eating. Okay. So I want to point this out. There's a big difference between cow meat and venison. There's a big difference between um, a store-bought apple and an apple that's been an heirloom apple that's been grown by your farmer. Mm-hmm. The difference is in the genetics right? So the venison comes from an animal. Let's say that you find somebody local to you who produces elk or deer meat. Even if they're growing that, even if they're raising that animal on a ranch or farm, that's a wild animal still. It's not been changed genetically. The cow's been changed for, I think, about 8,000 years. What original animal did a cow come from? The the original animal is called an aurochs. Oh, wow. And the aurochs was a massive beast, and it's the animal that we see often painted on those cave walls in France, you know, by those paleo peoples. A very powerful animal, but it's been extinct now for over 400 years. So you can say that a lot of the paleo people could be doing paleo, but they're doing really domesticated they're doing kind of paleo. A, they're doing a domestic version of a Neanderthal diet. Okay. And that's really funny because what we see is... You know, when we look at Neanderthal diets, and incidentally, that is very sophisticated work to piece together. Neanderthals are a cousin species of humans, and they're extinct. So to piece together their diet hasn't been easy, but we've been able to do it to a degree. Um, 
they ate a lot of meat and very little plant food. Um, that's the diet that these people are basing the paleo diet on, and I think that's crazy because, you know, is that crazy? I think that it's <laughs> ill-informed because we can actually look at human beings, homo sapiens, not homo sapien neanderthalus. We can look at homo sapiens sapien, our species, and we can see that we were living wild on this continent just a few hundred years ago, mm -hmm. right? The Native American peoples of North America were living here totally wild. They were in the Stone Age just a couple hundred years ago. We could go down to the Amazon and we could see the wild peoples there. We can go to Africa and see people like the Sun Bushmen and their diets and we can read about what they eat. These are human beings. We could go to... Australia and look at the Aboriginal people's diets. Right? We can see what we eat. We even have fossilized remnants of human poop that we can look at and see what we ate. Wow. And we know that we ate lots of plants. We eat hundreds of plants a year. Um, let me point this out about our, you know, a minute ago I was pointing out about the cow meat being a domesticated uh, form of the, you know, of what was once a wild animal, the right. auroch. Right. right. So for 400 years, that auroch species is gone. They're gone. They're extinct. And all that's left is the domesticated version of that animal called the cow. Okay. Whereas if somebody bought deer meat, the deer is still a wild animal. And the deer that they bought that, that, that meat came from has not been domesticated. There's a difference there. There's a difference in that food. Let me give you another example. Um, here's something interesting about plants. This is really, really fascinating. There's a group of plants, a whole suite of plants that we eat in our diet called the brassicas. Mm -hmm. Now, the brassicas contain many of uh, our vegetables. Like if we were to go to a supermarket, we would see a lot of these there. So I'll give you a list here off the top of my head. Uh, broccoli, kale, collard, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, cauliflower, broccolini, rapini, that is all the same plant. They're, they're one species. So just like okay. all of the different types of dogs that we see look really different, but they're all Canis lupus familiaris. They're one species. All those plants I just mentioned are actually just one plant. It's the same plant. What we're doing is we're mutating different parts of the plant. Okay making it appear different. Now, it's a wild version. The, the wild uh, Brassica oleracea plant grows in Scotland. And it's a very, very small, very indiscreet plant. You wouldn't look at it and think, oh, my God, that could become a massive cabbage. That could become broccoli. Mm -hmm. Very small herb. But we've, we've mutated it through the domestication process and made it produce a lot more food. Now, I'm not trying to say that that's a bad thing, but I do want to point out that what isn't a great thing is the fact that you might eat one of those plants each night of the week and think you have a variety of plants in your diet. Oh, right, right. So here's where we need to be careful. You could have broccoli on Monday, cabbage on Tuesday, cauliflower on Wednesday, rapini on Thursday, you know, Brussels sprouts on <laughs> Friday. You write down the line, kale on Saturday, and Sunday you might spring for something wild and have kohlrabi and think, wow, I, I've, I've eaten a lot of variety of plants and you've only eaten one plant. Wow, that's interesting. So really, there's not much variety when you go to the supermarkets at all. When you go to the supermarket, there's very little variety. Yeah. And this is true of, you know, for instance, it's also true of our lettuces. Now, we could go into a good supermarket and find six types of lettuce, but they're all the same plant, right? We could find a whole variety of alliums. That's the onion family of plants. Uh -huh. So we could find leeks, and we could find onions of all varieties, and we could find garlic. and They're all great, but they really all fall into this one category of family of plants. Um, we need to get as much variety as we can. Indigenous peoples, wild peoples, are eating hundreds of plants a year. The average American's only eating a small handful of plants a year. So we need to start to get some variety. Here's what I recommend. Go to your farmer's market. Find a local farmer's market and start to ask about their heirloom produce. Remember that the supermarket foods are the foods that have been bred for their shelf life, for their uniformity of color, mm -hmm. for their uh, shine, not for their nutrition, not for their taste. Okay. We know that. I mean, anybody who's had a tomato from the supermarket and then had a tomato from a farmer's market or grown their own tomato, I mean, there's no, it's light and day. There's no, dip, there's, it's just amazing how yeah. completely <laughs> different these things are. Um, that's because the one in the supermarket was grown for shelf life, for plumpness, for color, but not for its taste and not for its nutritional profile. And as you get deeper into nutrition, you'll find that taste and nutritional profile are very related. So do you the better a thing tastes, the more nutritious it is, unless it's been doped with chemicals. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, okay. So do you think that even though those plants are different, they're still pulling different minerals from the soil? Nope, or is nope, it? Nope. 
Oh, they're they're nearly ident they're ident they're the same plant. Ah, so okay. not only do they have basically the same nutritional value, um, and which is going to be very little if they're coming from say you know let's say that these are California organic. It's a great start, but you know there's it's limited soil there. We want to be eating food from our local environment, from the minerals from our local soil, if we can. So okay. that's one other reason I recommend you go to your farmer's market. Shipping these foods all over the world is pretty illogical, right? It doesn't really make sense to be built out of the soil and the water from some other place, right? So if you are eating California organic produce and you're drinking water from Fiji and you live in Minnesota, you're made out of Fiji and California, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very strange, right? Yeah. Um, not necessarily the best approach sustainably or for a health, in my opinion. But, but back to this, not only when you eat brassicola oleracea every day of the week are you getting only always the same nutrients, you're also getting the same anti-nutrients. Here's the thing about plants. Plants have sophisticated chemical defenses to make sure that you don't overeat them. That they don't have the ability to fight. They don't have teeth and claws, so they produce chemicals. The chemical, in bra again, if we're going to use Brassica oleracea as our example here, but this could be true of lots of different plants. Mm -hmm. um, they'll have lots of, uh, they'll have varieties of chemicals um, to protect themselves. Brassica oleracea, the broccoli plant, the kale plant, the collard plant, the cabbage plant, has um, a, a chemical in it that uh, inhibits your ability to incorporate iodine into your thyroid. Okay. So it's a goitrogenic plant. Now, when we cook it, that's much less, much less of that. Uh, but it's not something we want to live on every single day. But you can picture how you could live on it every day, not realizing you're only eating one plant. Okay. So we want to start looking at variety. So when you go to the supermarket, start really looking for those things you've never heard of. You know, what's an endive? Wow, I never had that. What is that? Start trying everything you can try. Get into some variety and then get with your farmer and start trying different things. They'll understand this stuff a lot better than most of us do because they actually work with these plants. I have at survival.com put together a seed kit, um, which is two, I believe, 200 varieties of plants. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that, actually. Now, here's what our thinking was. Yeah. You need as much variety as possible. You want to be getting these little... Every plant is a, is a su chemical suite. It contains all kinds of different substances that activate all different parts of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And we want to be sampling little bits of lots of different things. Now, I don't believe that in, pr in, the, in the days of the wild human, there was a huge separation between herbalism and diet. I think these things were pretty much um, unified. However, in our world today, herbalism, looking at herbs is a fantastic way to start bringing some chemicals into our body from plants that can simulate some of the variety we would have had in a wild diet. So if we are eating mostly supermarket food, getting onto some herbs can really help us, some medicinal herbs. Um, this includes, by the way, the class of herbs we call spices. Okay. So somebody could be using things like thyme, rosemary, sage, oregano, uh, marjoram. These are all uh, very close to wild plants that are very chemically active. That's why they taste so strongly. Okay. You notice how the more domesticated our plants get, the more bland they become. Right. Right. So That's what we do when we domesticate things. So when we're eating a wide variety of spices and we're getting herbs, maybe in the form of herbal teas, now we're starting to get some new plant chemical information into our bodies. I put together a seed kit that is a completely organic, completely heirloom, and every plant is close back to its wild stage as possible. And it's a seed can that's designed to be able to store for about 10 years. When you open it and plant it, it plants over an acre. And the idea is that there's all these different varieties of plants, both medicinal and food, so that you can start to increase it. Now, that's a little intimidating to people, right? So that's why I said start at, you know, maybe buying organic food, then get to your farmer's market. What are the next stages, though? The next stage is you start to grow food. Right. And even the real scary one, ooh, <laughs> we go out and we start to learn to forage some foods. Yeah. Which is an incredibly rewarding practice. Now, for most of us, it's more hobby than anything. And for some of us, it's downright frightening, the idea. I know the first thing people think of when you say, you know, eating wild plants is, well, oh my God, what if I poison myself? Yeah, everyone's afraid that's of that, what, you know. That's why I would recommend you, you get with some local community where there's herb walks. Maybe at your health food store, maybe online, you can find about people who do herb walks in your area. And you can get out with local experts or local hobbyists who know how to forage wild plants, who know how to forage uh, mushrooms, 
uh, who know how to forage herbs. And though it's becoming increasingly less popular, foods that are wild hunted are amazing. And I know that um, you know there's all kinds of interesting politics around that. Right. But the idea of wild game meats is, I think, fantastic. And again, gets us closer to that rewilded diet. Yeah, because you could actually do that with your meats as well as the different... Because most people, when they eat meat, they just eat the muscle meat, right? I mean, no one's really eating organs and things like that, but that's another well, way Well, actually, to... let, let's talk about who is, Justin. This is a great point. I appreciate you bringing this up. Yeah. Let's do a little thought experiment here. You and I, we go to the best restaurant in uh, the area. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm in Sedona, so let's say we go to the best restaurant, a place called Enchantment out here. Okay. And we sit down and we get that menu that gets put before the wealthy elite every single day. (laughs) Right. What do we see on there? We're going to look at the seafoods. They're going to be wild Alaskan salmon, Uh wild king crab, wild caught scallops. Then we get into the meats, grass fed bison, wild elk, Uh wild boar. We look over on the, um, the starters and we might see, uh, organ meats, right? Like we might see a rabbit liver pate. Uh We might see, Veal sweetbreads, which is a thymus gland, okay. right? So we'll see all that stuff. The wealthy elite of the world are eating organ meat. They are eating wild food. What else do we see on the plants on those menus? It's incredible. We're going to see wild foraged morel mushrooms, wild foraged black trumpet mushrooms, wild leeks, mm-hmm. right? Wild dandelion soup. Well, you, that's what the wealthy rich people, of the, the, the elite people of the planet are actually eating. So they're eating this very fancy version of the indigenous diet. Right. Now that's their food. They're eating organ meats. They're eating bone broths in the form of the reductions that are on their steak sauces. They're eating wild game. They're eating foraged foods. These restaurants send foragers out to forage these foods. And the foods that aren't wild, they get from local farms as often as they can. So it's really interesting that very wealthy people don't eat that necessarily because they're like, they secretly know it's healthier. Why do they eat it? Because it's the food that tastes the best. Wow, so do it you... It has the strongest flavors. So do you eat a lot of... I'm sure you do eat a lot of organ meats as well, right? I do, and I think that they're fantastic. And I think that we are so domesticated that they are very frightening to us and their right. flavors are very strange to us. So right. often we have to find creative ways to prepare them. But again, if you're a little intimidated by these things, I recommend a nice, uh, a nice night out at a very high-end restaurant where all that food is organic and local and wild and you can actually see that food prepared properly mm-hmm. by a chef who knows how... Because here's the interesting thing about, you know, I I read a book last year called, uh, a couple years ago, called Deep Nutrition. And in there, I was really struck by this idea that the French chefs had reached the pinnacle of human food preparation. And what they had learned to do was take each ingredient at its peak freshness Mm -hmm. and prepare it with minimal damage to release the most flavor. And what this person was pointing out was that what you're experiencing when you're eating a natural food, what we call flavor is equivalent to nutrition. Wow. Right? So I know, you know, and I was for a long time a part of the raw food community, and I know that's a big, that's becoming more and more mainstream. Mm -hmm. But what we see is that human beings have been cooking since the first human being was alive. So human beings didn't learn to cook. Our ancestors, before we were humans, in the form of Homo habilis even, was cooking. We can go far, far back into the ancient fossil records and find these hearths. People were cooking. So human beings never learned to cook, if that makes sense. We've been cooking all along. We are a species that lives on foods that have been cooked, and we cook in order to release more nutrition. But when we release more nutrition, we experience more flavor, because what our tongue perceives as flavor is nutrition. Now, that can be tricked with a lot of salt or with MSG, things like that. But when it's a natural food, more flavor equals more nutrition. And what a good chef learns how to do, and each one of you should be working on becoming a good chef. Uh If you care about food and you care about your diet, then learn how to cook. It's an amazing, amazing alchemical process. What we're trying to do is release as much nutrition with as little damage to the food as we can do. That's the key. So if I ask you to eat a, you know, what's, what's nicer, right? Like a piece of raw broccoli? 
or a piece that's been steamed just enough that the flavors emerge and it chews up nice in your mouth. I think that steamed piece is nicer. Right. And we, we intuitively know that, and it tastes better because our body says, yes, I'm getting access to more of the nutrition because you broke those cellulose cell walls, and I can now access the nutrients inside. Whereas with the raw broccoli, we can't get enough nutrition out of it. So, what, because we don't produce an enzyme that breaks down the cell walls of plants. So we've always cooked our plants. We have to cook our plants if we want to have enough nutrition. And one of the things you'll see in the raw food world, especially in the, the, the aspect of the raw food world um, that is really focused on plant food, like the vegan or vegetarian aspect of that, is that those people are very skinny people usually. Uh-huh, right. That's because they're, they can't access enough nutrition to keep their, their body weight up. So, so is it's that, a great way to lose weight, but it's not a great way to live. So is that because the cell wall, the cellulose, is not being broken down? Is that right? Well, two couple things are going on. Um, there's this fantastic book called Catching Fire. It came out a couple years ago, and it was the study of human cooking from an anthropological and archaeological perspective. And in that book, what they explored, one of the things they explored, was that you can actually get more calories from a cooked food than a raw food. Now, this is an, this is an important point to flush out a little bit, because we live in a culture where we are so saturated with calories that most of us think calories are bad. Right, right. In a wild environment, there are so few calories that you basically spend all of your foraging time, this is what indigenous people were doing, looking for calories. You don't want to burn calories if you don't need to in a wild setting because calories are not as available. Right, because a calorie is just energy. You wouldn't want to burn energy, would you? Yeah, you don't want to expend energy uselessly because you'd spend most of your time trying to get energy, right? right? right. So when I was talking before about those 15 to 20 hour work hours, uh, work weeks that indigenous people live, those are, that's time spent looking for food. You don't want to then burn that food off. Now, in our culture, we have too much food, and we end up trying to burn calories off. It's a, it's a weird thing. We buy the food, and the food is basically calories. Calories are units of energy, and it's basically stored sunlight uh-huh. energy. So we, we buy calories, and then we try to burn them off. Yeah, it makes no sense. <laughs> you know, Very strange, no right? Sense. But, uh, okay, so back to my point, which is that, uh, you know, if we feed pigs on raw potatoes and we feed other pigs on cooked potatoes, the ones who get the cooked potatoes will put weight on faster because the cooked potatoes have more calories accessible. Okay. Cooking makes more calories accessible, and it also breaks down cell walls, which we don't digest well. And so that allows us to get nutrients out. So again, if, if we went on to a raw food vegan diet, which I did for many, many years, mm-hmm. um, you know, I weigh about 175 pounds now. I weighed 135 pounds when I did that. Whoa. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was a very skinny person on that diet. Uh, two things were going on. One, I wasn't getting enough nutrition out of those plant cells. Two, I wasn't getting enough calories out of those food, and I would have gotten more calories and more nutrition if I had cooked them. So a lot of us think, oh, doesn't cooking destroy nutrients? Overcooking does. You know, a fry later at McDonald's does. A I little have... steaming, a quick sear, that's uh-huh. not destroying nutrients. That's actually making them more available to us. Yeah, and then applying that really black and burn thing on the meat, and you know, I would imagine that would be really destructive as well. Of course, right? So mm-hmm. this is a... So here's the thing. We live in that kind of black and white thinking culture, right? Good, bad, night, day, right? Everything is like this or that. Right. So we don't, we're not real good with gray area. So we tend to think of a thing as raw or cooked. But there's a big spectrum, right? Because cooking could mean that we blackened it to charcoal, right? Or it could mean that it got a 30-second sear. Well, those are really different things, right? Exactly. You know, if you go to, um, say, a restaurant and you order something uh, very rare, you know, the outside looks nice and cooked, and then you cut it open, and it's pretty much raw inside. Uh-huh. So how have we destroyed it through that process? Most of it's still totally intact, right? Right. So it's, an inter- it's an interesting thing. Cooking is a spectrum. You know, when we cook, um, say, with water so that we did something like steaming a vegetable, you know, water can't go above 212 degrees, right? That's mm-hmm. its boiling point. So if we're steaming something, it's only being steamed at 212 degrees, 100 degrees Celsius. This is um, very low temperature. It's not even enough to destroy any of the vitamins that are present. So um, cooking is a spectrum. And we're wise to uh, cook properly at the minimum amount of, dis- doing the minimum amount of destruction and the maximum amount of nutritional release. And um, 
Right. I think most of the, the good schools of cookery out there today uh, teach that. Um, and I think combining that with lots of fresh, light raw foods is valuable because most of us in our culture have too many calories. So raw foods can be valuable for us in order to keep our calories down a little bit so we don't grow too much because, you know, we don't have any food scarcity here. And food scarcity is something that's very common in the wild. Um, and brings me to this concluding point, which is that we have to actually replicate. If we want to be very healthy and vigorous, we have to actually replicate some food scarcity. Because mm-hmm. we don't have that built in. We don't have a time of feast and a time of famine. We just have a time of feast. So you're talking about replicating a time of feast and famine in your own life. I think that's a really valuable thing. And I've learned that uh, through many, many years of actively experimenting with food in, uh, you know, and with the, this topic of rewilding in mind. Uh-huh. What I've learned is that I benefit the most by waiting till later in the day to eat so I don't eat a big breakfast. In fact, I really don't eat breakfast. Okay. Um, and then a few nights a week, I'll have a very hearty, well-cooked meal. And then other nights of the week, I'll have much lighter food. Sometimes I'll even skip meals. And what I'm doing is kind of trying to replicate feast and famine. What I notice is if I eat a big meal one night, I don't need another big meal the next night and another big meal on and on and on and on. I can sort of cycle it. And I like to cycle through times of eating more and times of eating less. So I'll eat very lightly. I'll even juice and live on a lot of liquids and blended drinks. And then when I start to feel like, wow, I'm really hungry, I'll dive in and I'll have something heartier. Um, and I do that with animal foods as well. I'll eat, you know, if I have a, uh, something with a lot of meat, um, then maybe the next night I won't. And I'll eat more of vegetarian. And I think that that's smart because that's what we see in indigenous cultures is that sometimes there's a lot of food available. Sometimes there's less. Sometimes there's a successful hunt. Sometimes right. there's not. Right, right. So, Daniel, I know you're on your way out and you got company there, but I wanted to ask you one quick question before. Uh, you just mentioned it about how you do some juicing. And, you know, I read a lot of paleo blogs and, and paleo books and things and all kinds of stuff like that. And they always ask the question, is this type of food paleo? Is it not? And, you know, a lot of people would say juicing is not a paleo food, but. It seems to me that even though a juice is not something that we would have naturally eaten in our culture 100,000 years ago, it still could be beneficial to us if we did it right, wouldn't it be? Well, okay, so here's an interesting point. First, well, a couple. First, I want to be clear that I love aspects of the paleo thinking, Mm -hmm. but I think just like everything, it becomes a rigid dogma. And we have to be really careful of that. Remember, I was pointing out, you know, I have a, a friend, an amazing botanist um, and an amazing wild food forager, probably one of the best in the world at what he does. Mm-hmm. Um, he has studied ancient people and their diets more than probably most, most of the people on the earth today. And he actively goes out and forages these foods, lives off of a huge percentage of wild calories. He has been sending a document that he wrote showing how much plant food paleo people actually consumed even in the high Arctic. Oh, wow. You, know, you would think, well, the Eskimo, they probably, what did they, they didn't even have plants. They consumed a lot of plants. He presented that information to groups um, in the paleo world. I'll say largely, uh, I, wanna be, I don't want to name anybody specific, but mm-hmm. we'll say in that world of, of thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they keep rejecting that document. Why? Because they have a dogma about food. Mm-hmm. So if we were going to step outside that and say, look, I, the paleo thing is an important piece and it can inform our diet, but we don't live then and we are not those people. We are the domesticated form. Mm-hmm. Just like our dogs. See, we, don't, you know, we wouldn't expect our dogs to go out and hunt deer down and eat them raw. Right. Because our dogs are domesticated. So we have to create a diet that still gives them the same stuff, but is altered to accommodate their domestication. We are not Neanderthals, um, so we have certain <laughs> needs that are slightly different. Our digestive tract is different today. Uh-huh. It's changed. We're changed. Um, I find that when I drink juice moderately, I feel fantastic from it. I feel wonderful. It's a way for me to concentrate a lot of plant material, particularly chlorophyll, into one place. Uh-huh. Because I'm not foraging all day long, munching all day long off of wild plants, not like I wish I could. Right. So it allows me to get it all concentrated in one place. And the proof's in the pudding. Now, I don't... What, see, the paleo response to that is often a response to the raw food vegan juicing paradigm, which is, oh, you should just live on juice. Uh-huh. 
Right. You should juice six times a day. So now you've got those people on the other side saying, oh, no, you should never do it. Well, like, the truth's always somewhere in the middle, right? Like there's benefits. Let's not overdo it. And let's not reject it. There's some value to both. Yeah, because there are a lot of new foods that are in our diet today, you know, like algaes and things like that, that probably weren't eaten many, many hundreds of thousands of years ago, but it seems like they could still be beneficial. And I, I think you think that too. I do. And the other thing is, is that mo actually, I would say that there's, there's not a lot of new foods. What there are is foods from different regions that most of us have never heard of. Right. So algae, for instance, were, were consumed by people, mm -hmm. but not everybody. So there are foods from all over the world, and every place in the world, people ate a diet based on those local foods. Now we're a global economy, which means those foods have come out, and we're getting foods that maybe are not, were never represented in our ancestry. Oh, right, right. And that, that's okay, right? That, like you're saying, this is great. Like, we have access to some new foods. Fantastic. We're global now. Um, I think we need to be careful about rejecting things based on a rigid dogma. Oh, that's never been there. We shouldn't do it. That, that's not really a fair way to represent, especially if that dogma is coming out of um, an ill-informed paradigm right. that we are Neanderthals. We're not Neanderthals. Plants play heavily into our diets and always have. And what we find is, interestingly, there's, um, you know, traditionally, men typically hunt, women typically gather. Uh-huh. Women would bring home plant foods, men would bring home meats. Women are more reliable in hunter-gatherer societies with bringing home plants than men are with bringing home meat because sometimes they can't catch the meat. Right, right. So sometimes they'd eat vegetarian. Have you ever heard that joke, vegetarian's an ancient indigenous word for bad hunter? <laughs> I've heard right? that before. It's yeah. kind of like that. The men would come home, oh, sorry, ladies, we didn't get anything. Well, luckily the ladies brought tubers, you know, leaves and nuts. Right, right, right. So the idea of like completely rejecting the plant side of the diet, it's almost like a sexist thing. It's almost like a male um, obsessed hunting dominated mind. Right, right. And it's not a fair balance of what humans actually do. There's a beauty, you know, that division of labor between men and women is unique to humans. No other animal does it. No other animals thought of that yet. No, not even the chimps have realized that the women could do one role and the men could do another role and together the synergy would be greater than the sum of the two parts. So... The fact that we have women bringing us plants, and men bringing them meat, and we can combine together is brilliant. We need to create that in our diet. So we need to not go too far down that paleo road, and we need to go not too far down that vegan road to mix those two worlds. I think that's just so obvious. But again, we tend to tick-tock between extremes. Yeah, and we polarize everything and black and white everything. And So Daniel, uh, I know we've got to take off, and you are a busy man. What kinds of things are you working on with Sir Thrival? You got any projects going on and things like that? You know, we are we are working on a few interesting things, and something I've got. I don't want to say too much, and here's why: people keep copying my products. No, oh, do they? I come up with something cool, and people copy it. <laughs> but I. So I'll just give a hint. I'm working on um, an elk antler extract that'll be topical. It'll be incredibly rejuvenating to the skin, um, and it'll also feed that wild elk antler material into the bloodstream via the skin while rejuvenating the skin. I'm working on an amazing clay product I've been working on for some time now. Um, yeah, lots of interesting projects in the pipeline, you know, and also I'm completely rebuilding findaspring.com. That's going to be a much more robust website. Oh, yeah. uh, leading people to something we didn't get to talk much about today, but which is natural water, um, a huge passion of mine. So yeah. we're rebuilding that site. We're going to make it way more functional, way more modern, way more fun, and it's going to help more people find uh, natural, wild, living water in their area. Yeah, so my wife and I found the spring that we go to out in Lake Hemet from your website, Find a Spring. And so when do you think that might be relaunched? Is there any kind of ETA on that? or? Well, I'll say probably by the end of 2013. Oh, gosh, yeah. that's so cool. And, uh, you know, anybody who wants to visit that site and offer any kind of a donation, we'd really appreciate it because we are um, looking to gather the funds together because um, we want to make this a very robust site. We want it to be mobile friendly. We want to use geocaching and all those kind of things. And mm -hmm. the goal is that you'll be able to go up to a new spring and just push a button on your phone and it will be automatically uploaded to the site and more people can find that spring. Um, uh -huh. That's been such a fun project. It's been a labor of love. You know, we've never made any money off that site. So, 
so you know currently it's been a slow process rebuilding the site because you know basically having to fund that so um, yeah any contributions anybody wants to make are deeply appreciated and uh, regardless of that I'm going to try to have it out by the end of 2013 oh, that is so so cool well thank you Daniel for being on the show a lot of fun and man there's so many different tangents I could have gone down with you today but uh, it was it was awesome hey thanks for having me on thanks for letting me just kind of rant and rave it's a little early <laughs> in the morning for me so I, I kind of went all, all over the place and I, I just appreciate the space to share something I'm passionate about. No problem. Yeah, thank you. Wow, that was quite an interesting interview with Daniel Vitalis. He's an amazing guy. I love his work and I love the fact that he's not really into dogma and, you know, kind of polarizing himself one way to the other, one way or the other with the paleo thing or with the with the raw food vegan thing and he's a really great guy. I mean, he really kind of adds in all the different approaches to eating well. And if something is good, he tends to add it to his diet, whether it's paleo or raw food or not. And and he's a wild guy. I saw him once on YouTube eating raw meat with Chef Frankie G. That was pretty fascinating. He was doing some um, ceviche or some sort of raw meat with garlic and onion. And <laughs> he's a wild guy. So anyway, I just want to thank you for being on this interview and listening to this call and joining us here for another edition of Extreme Health Radio. So fun. What did you think about everything he was saying? I'd love to hear what you uh, what you think about it. And that was just kind of just a general overview of rewilding yourself. And I bet he could go very much in detail into each one of the different subjects, like the way you sleep and the way you work and things like that. So that was a really interesting interview. And we're going to have him on hopefully once a month. That would be really great. I just spoke with him off the air and it would be nice to get him on once a month and kind of build a library of content for you guys. And really interesting. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me on this show. It's really been a lot of fun. And if you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, we would greatly appreciate that. We've got hundreds of people on there now, and it's really great. We send out emails once a week. And if you're interested in doing that, you can sign up at extremehealthradio.com slash subscribe, or you'll see our um, places where you can sign up right there on our website on most of the pages there. And and also, we are 100% listener supported, and I want to thank you to the people that who have donated recently. Your donations are so amazing and they help keep the show running and help pay all of our bills here to keep the studio going and the equipment and all that kind of good stuff. And so we really thank you for your donations. And if you'd like to donate, feel free. Just uh, You can go to extremehealthradio.com slash donate uh, to do that. And a lot of people think that if they only donate a dollar or two, it's not going to really mean much. But if all of you guys did that, that would really, really help us a lot. So we don't want to charge for our shows or charge for any of this information. Everything's going to be free for people to download and to share and to learn and to really uh, get some value out of. So I also wanted to tell you about our store. We've got a great store on our website. I think there's over like 75 products and we've got blenders, the Vitamix blender, the Blendtec blender. We sell both of those. We sell a rebounder, the best rebounder on the market, the Bellicon. We sell the sauna and the Ejuva cleanse. We sell all kinds of different fermentation products, how-to courses and dehydrators and all kinds of great stuff. So if you're ever in the market for these kinds of materials, these kinds of courses or programs or even physical products, please check out our store and support us and your order will help give us a commission and uh, and help run this radio show. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions, please just email me, justin at extremehealthradio.com or you could find me on Facebook, extremehealthradio.com slash Facebook if you want to join us on